photoperiod is a really strong driver here. And animals tend to use that to trigger and generate the, the changes that I've already talked about. Um, but there's obviously a temperature element there as well. Um, so there is some very early work in the 70s that showed even when photoperiod was um, kept constant, they still showed that underlying rhythm of um, body weight gain, um, hair growth, etc. So it's not simply um, it's not simply photoperiod. There's also a temperature element there as well. But but certainly photoperiod is the dominant one, and it doesn't really matter whether you've got an animal that's kept inside or with access to outside, like most of our cats and dogs here are. Um, they would still show that photoperiodic response. Hello, and welcome to the Pet Food Science Podcast, where our, our goal is to share research findings to help support the continual innovation in the pet food and nutrition industry. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Shoveler, and I'm here today with our guest, Dr. David Thomas from the University or from Massey University in New Zealand, who is going to talk to us about um, circadian and seasonal rhythms in dogs and cats and whether we should care about it. As a little bit of a background, David Thomas is an associate professor in companion animal science in the School of Agriculture and Environment at Massey University in New Zealand. David is an established academic with experience in the fields of animal science, gut and skin physiology, and companion animal nutrition. He obtained a BSc, or BS if you're in the U.S., in zoology from Dundee University and a PhD from the Institute of Zoology, University College London, in mammalian seasonal physiology and the topic for today. David's research interests include all aspects of companion animal nutrition, from the functionality of food supplements and ingredients, age and seasonal effects on energy requirements, health implications of high carbohydrate consumption, effects of inorganic versus organic sources of mineral supplementation, and optimal dietary fatty acid ratios. Today, we're going to talk about seasonal rhythms in intake, activity, and reproduction that influence animal health. David. Would you mind starting off telling us a little bit more about your research program at Massey and the overall program at Massey that you contribute to? Thank you, Kate. Um, Yeah, so I'm based in New Zealand, in the Lower North Island. And as as Kate said, um, I'm at Massey uh, on the campus at Palmerston North. Um, So we we run a Bachelor of Animal Science degree here as well as a vet degree. We're the only vet school in New Zealand. And um, I'm also in charge of two animal facilities at the university. Um, So we have a a cat colony, uh, which has existed for 30 years. Um, They're looking at nutritional, uh, all nutritional aspects of um, feline nutrition. And uh, we have a colony there of about 140 cats. And more recently, uh, we have a dog colony, uh, which has got 32 dogs. Again, it's a nutritional focus there as well. And I suppose um, what we have that's quite unique here is is a small-scale pilot plant, uh, which is designed really for human food, but I've managed to shoehorn my way in there. And we can manufacture uh, pilot-scale products uh, for pet food, and then obviously then they can go on and we can feed them to the animals in the colonies. So we've we've got a... um, a pretty unique situation here where everything is really nice and close together and we can, you know, it's interrelated with the different disciplines. Leading pet food manufacturers, renderers, and ingredient suppliers recognize that Kemen is assurance. Every day they deliver specialized expertise, innovative products, and unrivaled support through the pet food and rendering value chain. From oxidation control and food safety to palatability and nutrition, all the way through a suite of tailored services that allow you to feel supported from start to finish to ensure you're getting the most from Kemen ingredients. That's why every step of the way, Kemen Nutrisurance is your partner in pet food and rendering ingredients. 
Fantastic. And and would you mind speaking to a little bit of the, uh, a lot of our listeners, um, especially in North America, won't be as familiar um, with the group of experts at Massey University and at Ag Research. Um, would you mind expanding a little bit on um, your colleagues and collaborators? Yeah, sure. So we've, as I said, uh, I'm actually based in the uh, agricultural school. Um, so we have we have a, uh, close colleagues here in the Department of Animal Science, uh, which look at all aspects of uh, nutrition, genetics, um, welfare within the group here. Um, we've got equine specialists also associated with the degree. Um, and then we've got a, um, an animal clinic across in the vet school, which I work very closely with, with colleagues there. Um, and our animals are actually... Uh, looked after through the through the vet school there, so we have very close links. We've also got um, anal- analytical labs, so we've got um, a uh, veterinary pathology lab uh, for sample analysis and a very quick turnaround there. And we've got a nutritional uh, lab here also, uh, which is kind of external um, as well as internal for us. So. As you mentioned, we also have research organizations close by. Um, So AgResearch is a government-funded Crown Research Institute, as they're called over here, uh, which is basically full-time science researchers. And I've got very close links there uh, with the work we've done with the microbiome, um, utilizing all of their nice shiny toys um, to to get our analysis done. So we've got very close links there. We've also got another... Um, Crown Research Institute called Plant and Food, which is also based here on the site. So it's quite a concentration of scientists that we've got here um, within the within the local area. And, um, you know, we, we, we do collaborate and quite a the model we've actually approached is we've we've kind of sneaked into some of these groups by the back door. So the with the microbiome work, um, there's a huge interest here on rumen microbiome and we've managed to get our pet food samples in there alongside alongside that and and um it's it's worked really well and now we've actually got a little bit more funding to do our own research so yeah it, it's worked really yeah. well I love those examples um, in animal nutrition where I don't think a lot of people realize how different all the animals are but how um ideas generated in one species can propel um, information acquisition in another species. And I, I think that we do that a lot in pet nutrition. So um, you have a, a great res- reservoir there of, of experts to kind of fuel that curiosity. Um, so on that topic, uh, uh, you obviously know where I'm from in Canada, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, our environment uh, is quite a bit different uh, than your environment. So if we're going to start talking about seasons, um, uh, maybe we should define uh, a little bit what that means kind of to you globally when you start looking at seasonal variation and nutrient requirements. Um, and, And I could probably go off on all kinds of different geographical um, areas, but I'll, I'll try to keep pretty concentrated uh, between um, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, uh, North America, and, and Europe for the time being. Okay. So I suppose um, if we look at latitudes, so Palmerston North is on the equivalent latitude as Madrid. Um, so we're about... 30 degrees north, um, a little bit over that. And we do know that cats evolved between 30 and 60 degrees latitude. Um, That's where the closest wild type ancestors of the cat and the fossil record um, lies. So we're within, we're within that range, even though um, it's, it's actually really interesting down here because um, we've had species introduced for farming purposes. Um, such as such as the red deer, and their hormone profiles are quite different down here compared to their um, hormone profiles up in the northern hemisphere. So, when I actually did my PhD looking at red deer, we were looking at specifically prolactin, and it's got a really nice seasonal rhythm with a single peak. It's interesting the deer down here because they've I'm not sure 
the situation, but they have a double peak in their in their enzyme, uh, in their um, hormone pathway in terms of the prolactin. So it, there's a double peak. So something something changes a little bit um, when they've been sort of translocated down here for um, for basically farming purposes. Um, it may be the genetic strain or whatever that that we have down here compared to to the northern hemisphere, because we we've adapted quite a few of the of the species that we that we use down here. So, for instance, from our from our farm work, we've actually um, worked and genetically um, adapted the uh, border collies into our heading dogs to help move stock around. And we've changed their behaviours subtly, and we've changed their morphology a little bit as well. So it's actually it's actually really cool. I think I think that whole um, the whole thing around um, seasonal rhythms and the the research that I obviously did for my PhD that's sort of it's a consistent theme through my research um, since I started down here. Yeah. So 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 animals will physiologically and i'm not sure if adapt or acclimate is the better word here when we're talking about um, environmental differences and this must be um, everything from length of day to proximity to the sun um, i'm making stuff up now can you uh, keep uh, keep adding to that list so when we think about the environment and how that how seasons are different throughout the world. Um, what, what are the factors there? Um, so we do know physiologically that they use melatonin secretion during the nighttime hours that they use as basically an internal clock. Um, and my supervisor was really interested. My, my PhD supervisor in the UK was really interested in um, the clock gene. And and how animals how animals basically tell the time and he managed to um, access uh, tau mutant hamsters which had a defect in their clock gene so this is this is really where I got into the whole whole seasonal rhythm thing and working with my PhD in in red deer we the challenge here is that animals need to be able to predict the future in order to adapt to uh, change in environment so as you go from long day summers into short day winters, there's certain elements within the animal that need to be triggered in order to adapt them to cope with the colder temperatures in winter. So my PhD and a certainly some of my research um, since I've got out here indicates, you know, for instance, coat growth. They need to be able to trigger the growth of that winter coat well before they need it because it takes two to three months to grow through the skin. So there needs to be seasonal cues that they're using usually in the spring, uh, and which is then entrained through the rest of the year to allow them to uh, be fully adapted to that environment. Okay. So given that we have um, both dogs and cats globally that are housed sometimes entirely inside, sometimes a combination of inside-outside for both species. How does that affect their ability to regulate seasonal rhythms, um, given what you just talked about? Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question because um, photo period is a really strong driver here, and animals tend to use that to trigger and generate the, the changes that I've already talked about. Um, but there's obviously a temperature element there as well. Um, so there is some very early work in the 70s that showed even when photo period was um, kept constant, they still showed that underlying rhythm of um, body weight gain, um, hair growth, etc. So it's not simply... Um, it's not simply photo period. There's also a temperature element there as well, but but certainly photo period is the dominant one, and it doesn't really matter whether you've got an animal that's kept inside or with access to outside, like most of our cats and dogs here are. Um, they would still show that photoperiodic response. Now, it might well be dampened, so it may not be as extreme as as what we've seen in in the certainly the cats in our colony. There, they've got an open courtyard that they've got access to 
in, in their colony cages. So they are exposed to both temperature and photo period, and they're exposed to those outside conditions. Um, we, we really don't have the kind of extreme weather that you experience up in Canada. So we maybe have three or four frosts in a winter and our summer temperatures high 20 degrees Celsius. So we are, we are a little bit more sort of um, benign, I suppose, compared to your extremes where, you know, you're under quite a lot of snow for quite a lot of the winter. Yeah, I, I have, excuse this question because I'm not sure this is going to be clear, but given that, do you, is there a negative or positive repercussion of being exposed to um, either more extreme daylight shifts? So if you're closer, further away from the equator, your summers will be longer days and your winters will be much shorter days than um, anybody who's closer to the equator. Does how does that factor into the changes that the animals experience? Um, I think what it does do is probably change the rate of change. So an animal in a more extreme scenario um, has to deal with with a faster photoperiodic change. So they have to, you know, potentially they're not dealing with um, these these more subtle gradual changes. And they will prob- you will probably see, or you do see in the wild, more extreme morphological changes as well. So a thicker winter coat or a, a double coat uh, having to be developed and probably more resources going into those kind of scenarios. It's, it's been really interesting um, monitoring the cats in the colony here. We, we show, um, because we ad lib feed our cats with wet food, canned diets, we see massive body weight changes in, in seasonal rhythms. So our males are up to one kilo heavier in the winter than they are in the summer, which which is absolutely phenomenal considering um, the way that the industry is regulated, considers everything is is pretty flat. And, you know, when we talk about AFCO feed tests, uh, which, which probably quite a lot of the audience are, are fairly aware of, you know, you've got an animal that, that fails an AFCO feed test if it loses 50% of its body weight at the start of the test. So, you know, you have a scenario there where in a typical seasonal environment, um, any diet will fail an AFCO feed test under those conditions. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point, but that also brings me kind of back. I mean, we, we talk about a lot of stuff that affects the pet food industry, but also need to think about things that affect the health and well-being of cats and dogs. And I know on a comparative nutrition basis um, that zoos, for example, do follow seasonal seasonal, um, feeding patterns. So should we be keeping our dogs and cats at this static weight, um, might it be better for them to fluctuate? Um, but all questions for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say personally, I think it's more natural to show that fluctuation in seasonal rhythms. Now, the I suppose this the caveat for that as well is that we – have artificially extended the lifespan of our pet animals into a life, certainly a geriatric stage of life that they wouldn't experience naturally in the wild. So there's some really interesting sort of philosophical questions generally around, um, you know, how, how close is our pet population to the wild population? How much can you extrapolate from a wild scenario back to a, back to a pet scenario? But we, the ingredients that we use for pet food fluctuate seasonally as well Um, so certainly here in New Zealand where where we actually look at diets that are made predominantly in canned diets from from offal from our from our meatworks they are going to vary hugely during the year according to what's what class of stock are being um, being killed Um, and we don't even start to understand that so we know that we know that obviously the 
the, the macronutrient profiles are well above those minimums, but we don't know what the micronutrients are doing um, even now. And been talking to the industry over here around understanding variation within these within these um, ingredients because it's it's a major, I think it's a major concern not really understanding how these change fluctuate during the year. Yeah, no, I definitely, I, I definitely agree. The fluctuation, and it's not the essential nutrients. Uh, often, it's these other compounds that were that that we find in plants, and then the animals that consume those. Uh, we don't really have a good idea without doing some good monitoring. I, I com- I completely, uh, completely agree. Um, on that note, too, it, it changes their. Um, the other thing is, is that the animals might change their environment seasonally based on the availability of uh, the best food. And so we talk about uh, what dogs and cats will do in the wild, well, not wild, but if, if they are feral, not their wild ancestors or or their uh, wild counterparts, but they too will adapt very quickly in order to get food. Um, so... Uh, have you ever, I, I just have to ask, have you ever pitched um, a seasonal rotation of food for dogs and cats? You must have, right? Yes, I have. Um, and a lot of our research suggests that the nutritional bottleneck occurs in the autumn where you've got a load of competing aspects from a physiological point of view. So, we, you know, we've already talked about the growth of the winter coat, which has been going to be occurring during that time. Um, we also, with our entire queens in the colony, we know that there's a huge impact of cycling on a whole range of other things. So the, the body weight gain into winter is delayed two months in entire queens compared to neutered queens. So you've got a, you've got a desexed queen, its body weight rhythm looks very similar to a male cat, a tom. Um, and you've got that huge delay, which is purely due to competing physiological processes and reproduction wins out. Um, and there's certainly very convincing evidence around other species that winter coat growth is delayed in lactating females as well. So, you know, you've got those, those kind of aspects occurring. Um, it's potentially not life-threatening in a pet situation, because you know nutrition is being provided all the time, um, but it would be very interesting to actually look at how you could target that window and improve coat quality and and potentially um, you know overall health of the animal with with a maybe a, a better quality protein source or a supplement alongside that because we know that that's the time of year when things really do that's the crunch time. Yeah, that that's so interesting, Dave. Because I I don't have indoor outdoor um, colony animals here at Guelph, but but I work I, I work with um, mushers um, who have their dogs out twenty four seven, and and you've just made me realize one of the phenomenon phenomenons that we have seen is they start to increase feed intake before before they start ramping up exercise and it's right around the end of September, beginning of October. Um, so right in line, well, on the Northern hemisphere with, with fall. Um, and, and then there to your point earlier, you know, us being in Canada and having this kind of extreme shift in temperature, um, they ramp quickly. Um, and, uh, yeah, very, very fascinating. Um, so the other, the other part that you bring up here is, is this idea about shifting nutrient requirements due to different competing physiological, um, demands. Um, so if, if you are to advise, um, owners, veterinarians, pet food companies about when animals might need additional energy, amino acids. Uh, there might be some um, vitamins involved in that I- as well. Uh, what what are you what are you kind of thinking here? What are your recommendations about the when? Um, I suppose the. The biggest sort of elephant in the room here is that 
um, overnutrition is potentially a bigger issue in the industry than undernutrition at certain times of the year. So let's let's maybe put that out there. Um, but in terms of in terms of subtle changes that um, that you can potentially need to add in there, um, we do know that coat quality um, and the keratin is sulfur amino acid based. Um, so if you are looking to, you know, if you're a breeder and you're looking to show your cat or mostly cat, um, then maybe supplementation with sulfur amino acids at certain times of the year that would, would really help with um, coat quality, although I haven't done that research to understand, you know, how, how you can impact um, coat quality in, in that area. Um, certainly um, fatty acids could be a real issue um, at those times as well in terms of in terms of coat quality but I mean when you when you actually look at the coat it's it is a really cool tool to use to assess underlying nutrition I mean it, it is the first thing to suffer and the last thing to recover from potential um, lower levels of nutrition so you know I think I think we've we've got a range of tools that we can use to try and assess these things we've obviously got body condition um, which yeah, I'm not sure how well owners generally are on assessing body con, con, uh, body condition score, um, but but yeah, I do think we have we've got some tools there that we can actually um, utilize. Um, we I haven't done the research to actually try and target this this window specifically, um, but we've really we do really see um, that's the time of year uh, when we when we sort of see those issues. Yeah, you you and I do uh, both share the um, intrigue about whether uh, if if requirements change throughout the year, but we fail to change the diet, that means that we have animals shifting between nutrient sufficiency and nutrient deficiency at different times of the year. And when you start to pepper in other information coming from other animals that we have fed well, what we thought was we believed we were feeding agricultural animals optimally, but what we were trying to do is minimize our nutrient excesses. So we were meeting, we were really try- feeding them right close to what we believed the requirement was, not appreciating that any insult that they might be confronted with all of a sudden puts them from nutrient surfeit into nu- nutrient deficit. And now you've added the idea of potentially um, season doing that in, in our animals. Um, so so that is, uh, that's a fascinating, fascinating concept that I think that the pet food industry could really um, uh, do something about if, if, if they focused on, on that as a product. So, Let's maybe take a deep dive into the other part of seasonal rhythm, which is circadian rhythm of dogs and cats. And um, tell us a little bit more about the circadian rhythm of, of, of dogs and cats and maybe how that um, brings us towards uh, nutrition. Yeah, so this is, this is an area that I'm, I'm really – pursuing a little at the moment with a with a PhD student um, so we have done quite a lot of behavioral work around understanding um, understanding what what the rhythms are in terms of activity of of cats in the colony um, I understand it's you know it's, it does tend to focus around feeding time in the in the late morning um, but but naturally in looking at feral animals that they cats really are crepuscular in terms of their activity rhythms with a peaking dawn and dusk and we do see that in our cats as well so you know cats specifically are, are very different from a from a sort of um, feeding behavior point of view compared to dogs but um, and I think they're more interesting to study anyway, but personally. Um, but we, we do see that they, they um, in our ad lib feeding regime that we have in the colonies, that they will have 10, 12 meals a day and they will get up and 
and have their meal and walk, walk back. And uh, But they do spend an extreme amount of time resting and inactive. Um, so we are looking now to, um, to validate uh, accelerometry research to identify individual behaviors. And um, this PhD student of mine, Michelle, has developed machine learning techniques to actually use the three um, axes in an accelerometer um, to look at rhythms and signatures that you can actually then use to predict the individual behaviors. And she's got some really close correlations. So this will mean that instead of watching hours and hours of video, we can put accelerometers on animals and um, then just download them and get and get activity with them. So we can look at the impacts of behavioral enrichment um, or the impact of, say, a joint supplement, for instance, later in life and assess whether that improves grooming behavior potentially. Um, so the, the sky is the limit and it means means that we've we've got a really powerful tool then to to look at changes to both management and also nutrition in, in these animals. Because um, we don't really understand what, I mean, we've, we've discussed this previously, but healthy aging is this, this it is the holy grail out there. Um, this is what owners really want for their pets. And we, we really aren't close to defining what that actually is. Yeah, I think uh, the best the best piece of evidence that we have is is just not letting our pets get overweight. We know leads to longevity um, and to a longer, healthy life um, as well, which is what we want. Um, I, not just for our pets, but for us. I, I want a great life, and then um, preferably just to drop dead out of nowhere one day would be my preference, rather than decline slowly over time. Um, so. So on that note, so when we're not not on the note of, uh, by the way, uh, dropping dead all of a sudden, that not on that note, but when we think about uh, the circadian rhythm, and you talked about them being crepuscular, you you uh, mentioned their interaction with humans, and we I and I think I've already offered you any of the activity monitor data that that is valuable from our colony for yours, but indeed we don't have volunteers come in on Saturdays and Sundays. We don't do socialization with them, but we do. And their activity is significantly lower on the weekend. I I mean, they definitely perform for the humans that come in and interact with them. And so uh, they are, they are quite, uh, quite good at honing in on that. But the other thing that I noticed uh, when I went in and checked on my, my students is the number of things that they show the cats on screens. And, um, this doesn't bother me because it's during the day and, and the lights are on. Obviously, we don't come in in the middle of the night. But if, if they're exposed to normal light and, and they can p- maintain their daily and seasonal rhythms uh, largely due to light, what is all the artificial light in our house potentially doing to those rhythms in our dogs and cats? Yeah, I, I suppose it's probably a combination of that and constant temperature as well. So, you know, I think given that given that combination, we're probably likely to see weaker rhythms in our in our pets compared to certainly feral animals or or animals that've got access to outside or are kept outside, which which, you know, we we've, we've got some animals here in New Zealand that are that are housed outside. Um, so we, Michelle, the PhD student I mentioned previously, is actually looking at cats kept outside, inside with outdoor access, and inside only. Um, so she's just completed the second half of a study, which because we've just come through our winter. So she's looking at it in midsummer and in midwinter. So that will hopefully answer, if we've got enough power by the, the number of cats remaining at the end of the study, um, that will hopefully start to answer some of these questions around, you know, is is there a difference in the intensity of some of these behaviours um, according to housing condition? And what are we actually doing by by keeping an animal inside under pretty constant temperature and, and artificial light regimes? I mean, we just don't know. 
Um, rather than sort of, you know, doom and gloom here, um, we do know that cats and dogs are living longer. You know, the, the, there's, there's convincing evidence out there, veterinary vet, better veterinary care, but obviously better nutrition and uh, owners that are prepared to, to invest heavily in their, in their pets. So I don't think it's, you know, I don't think we're, we're doing anything, you know, that would be hugely detrimental, but it would be really interesting to see whether or not we actually, it's, it's not optimal maybe, I don't know. Would be really yeah, well, if, if if we identify any problems, then then we have more things to solve, and and uh, and and we just get co- closer and closer to better and better health. Uh, like you said, uh, it, we haven't we haven't reached the pinnacle. We haven't, you know, uh, there's there's a lot more advancements to make. And I I certainly, you know, I I was talking to a colleague today about um uh, about happy lights. Um, because it, 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 we can have quite short days and there's quite a bit of winter seasonal depression, um, in the Northern hemisphere and definitely the more North that you go. And, and there's, there's definitely benefits to being exposed to the right, uh, light to improve, um, your mental health, um, in general, along with a whole series of other tools, but we need those tools for, uh, our pets too. So I'll be looking for your happy light for dogs and cats later, um, this year, Dave. Um, So when we then think about um, when we feed our dog and cat um, in our household, um, and we think about that's a lot more circadian. um, And I would imagine, does does that mean then, I, I think we, in general, most dog and cat owners either feed their dog and cat at the meal times that they have, um, or we see a little bit more with cat owners. We see some ad libitum feeding or filling the bowl when it's empty type of approach. Um, what do you recommend in terms of how to feed dogs and cats based on their circadian rhythm? And does that change depending on the season? That's a complicated question. Um, it would obviously change according to the season. Um, as as we've sort of touched on in the wild, in the feral state, cats and dogs uh, will switch prey types according to whatever's whatever's most common. Um, basically, they're just they're just trying to get protein from whatever source. Um, we've, we've got a, we've pretty much got a, um, an environment here in New Zealand where we do have feral cats living wild. And I've done a little bit of work with DOC, which is our department of conservation who do routinely, um, pest control measures out in the wild. And we've, um, I've actually managed to get hold of cats that have been um, euthanized as part of those programs and looked at stomach contents at different times of the year. And it's amazing the amount of, of insect protein that they were obviously consuming. Uh, we have quite large insects here called wetters, which, which fill the same niche as mice do in most of the rest of the world. Um, and these there's, there was fairly con- consistent evidence of wetter consumption, if you like, by these cats. So, so I think you, you're talking about consuming protein from whatever source, um, whether it be bird, um, um, small mammal, because we have obviously rats and mice introduced over here as well, um, and, and insect as well. So I, I'm intrigued actually by the idea that we are probably quite close to feeding our cats in the normal way that they would hunt. Um, if we get up early in the morning at certain times of the year when it is dawn and feed our cat, then that would be right in their wheelhouse in terms of when they would naturally be hunting. And at the same time, we get home at night and probably feed another uh, another feed. Um, that would that would correspond to the to the um, the dusk type hunting as well. So, I mean, I think by chance we've probably. Um, yeah, we've, we've probably stumbled upon something that's sort of quite close to what would be natural in, in the cat world. Um, what is probably unnatural is 
were leaving dry food out during the daylight hours um, for them to, to to graze on through there. But I'm 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 remain sort of unconvinced around um, how those different feeding patterns are impacting the overall health. Apart from the fact that I don't think people portion control their dry food. Um, that's that's the biggest issue out there. Um, and I don't think it takes too much to to measure out how much a cat will need during the day from a, into a pot and then just tap up top up the bowl from that. I think it's a very simple way to do things, and I think that's what really should be um, should be you know, probably got out there a lot more. It is around portion control because it doesn't take much overfeeding to ramp up into a into an overweight and obese animal. Absolutely. You know, and, and yeah, I mean, some studies have that. Those levels up around forty percent for cats, and even higher for cat for dogs. Yeah, I think one of the other problems with cats is that people just can't appreciate how much smaller they are than us, um, and and they kind of scale down to that right. Oh, that looks like so little food, and exactly. and you're so excited to eat, and so you find yourselves in the in this situation where you you almost uh, seem cruel with your recommendations. But to make you feel better, uh, Dave, I do calculate my uh, cat's um, uh, feeding requirement and then I uh, get the most appropriate single. I, I find the most appropriate single dish. So when it's not me feeding, that there's less uh, screwing it up in my, in my household. So there's that. So that brings me to feeding recommendations, though. So if we could actually get people to follow feeding recommendations, that's the first thing. Let's just assume that we can. Um, should maybe we start considering slightly different feeding recommendations for, for, for example, fall versus the rest of the year? Um, and we have hardly any recommendations on pack, um, for example, breeding bitches and breeding queens, um, and I, I think probably there uh, they they we teach it. We teach to start feeding, um, uh, so whether I do a lot more on dog, but we talk about pre-breeding, uh, feeding optimization. We talk about um, um, uh, I'm going to use parturition because I'm. Um, I'm blanking on the word uh, queening for cats and yeah. whelping yeah. for dogs. There we go, whelping. Yeah. Um, and we talk about post-whelping nutrition and the need for really high nutrition and early lactation. But would it would the industry benefit from having – more conversations about how feeding recommendations actually move rather than these these minimum guidelines that we have and then we say oh monitor the body weight of the dog or the cat and that doesn't seem to be working out very well for us what how can we change feeding recommendations to to do better to optimize more yeah i think i think there's there's a big problem here um cuz feeding recommendations are for the average dog and that does that animal doesn't exist. So, in in the colony we we have um, so our our ME requirements to maintain a stable body weight in our dogs range from anything from eighty percent of what would be normal up to one hundred and twenty percent. And that is that is across a fairly they're all medium breed dogs. Um, we we do have Harrier hounds and and uh, working farm dog models within within the colony. But I mean, those dogs are not really that different, but they do differ in underlying basal metabolic rate. So, you know, you've got that. Um, getting back to um, certainly queening, I think you are limited by the format that you can feed as well. Um, so you can't get nutrition into a queen from a wet food diet. Uh, we, we have to supplement feed dry alongside the wet for those certainly peak lactation when they've when she's she's got multiple kittens although you know we've we've got a queen at the moment with a single kitten nigel um who's doing very well he's well ahead of the growth curve uh just on just on the milk that um, she's producing for him but um yeah he's not yeah. competing dave it's nice and easy <laughs> yeah, exactly 
<laughs> yeah, Nigel, no mates. So, yeah, so it's, I think you have to be a little bit aware of that as well around nutrient density and hitting those requirements, who, which, which are basically maximal. You know, if you've, if you've got a queen that's, she's putting a lot of her own resources into those kittens at the detriment of herself as well. So, you know, we, we monitor the, the weight of the, our queens as well as our kittens to make sure the kittens are on the right trajectory, but also that the queens are not losing weight so quickly because uh, it does take a while to build them back up. Yeah, I think, too, um, trying to find ways to reduce energetic losses from the queen herself uh, during lactation um, um, would would be interesting. And and I I don't think that we really know enough about lactational control um, Mm -hmm. in these animals either. And and yet we have a huge demand and we have a lot of people um, breeding dogs and cats out there um, with, I think, very, very little really information to back up their approaches. So uh, just an area that's that's ready to, for more research funding. So um, yeah, I hope a lot of people get in contact definitely. with you because and I mean, of, yeah, we, we haven't, we haven't even touched on creep feeding with the, with the kittens as well. You know, we, we do, you know, obviously soak biscuits to, to make some, a kind of gruel, but, but we really, you know, there's, there, that is a lack in that there's, there's a gap there in the, in the industry around, research in those areas to actually get those kittens off to a great start. 84 million times a day, pets eat meals with ingredients from Trow Nutrition. We bring together the science of ingredients, nutrition, and blending to unleash possibilities for pet food brands. Premixes are just the start. Turn to Trow for higher inclusion ingredients too, like proteins and carbohydrates, and highly sensitive ingredients like probiotics. With our palatants and base blends, you can feel confident about what comes in our bags and goes in yours. Learn more at TroutNutritionPets.com. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think my conjecture on that would be that that it's almost a separate industry and the pet food industry is super targeted at the pet owner, not not the breeder, not working dogs necessarily, or, or you know, another great example of a high demand dog would be military dogs uh, between uh, mental and physical stress. Um, their nutrient demands are through the roof as well. So um, just so, so much to consider. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Um, clearly, we have more to talk about. Uh, I can't wait to get you back. Um, we haven't even started talking about healthy aging. So next time, uh, you and me uh, will have a great healthy aging uh, conversation and where we can go with that because that also is an area ripe for um, improvements uh, for the dog and cat or a focus on it. So thanks again, Dave, and um, I hope that that you have a fantastic day and we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you very much.